Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And he is risen to be a thief, is he not? Now that sounds strange, but remember Jesus described himself this way. He said, my coming to you again will be like a thief in a night, in the night. And even on that first Easter evening, we find Jesus not knocking on the door, but breaking in. There is no knocking for our risen Lord. There's a time and a place, to be sure. There's a time and a place for knocking, for politely waiting, for those on the inside to answer. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Maybe you know this verse from Revelation. There we hear the ascended Lord saying to the lukewarm church of Laodicea that was in danger of being spit out of his mouth, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Yes, Jesus knows how to knock. It's not a question of whether he knows or not. Jesus knows that there is a time and a place for knocking and for waiting and being invited in and then sitting down together. But that Easter Sunday night, they weren't about to answer if Jesus knocked. And so our Lord broke in. And what a wonderful theft. Fear and sorrow taken away, joy and peace given in their place. Can you imagine here this morning what would have happened if Jesus had knocked? If Jesus had minded his manners and calmly and quietly waited out, he'd still be waiting there, wouldn't he? It may seem strange, but I highly doubt that those disciples were ever going to open the door that was locked on the inside, especially, especially if the person who knocked said, hey, boys, it's me, Jesus. Yeah, right. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how long our Lord would have had to wait for those disciples to open up to him? They were locked. They were locked, the text says, for fear of the Jews. And I'm sure that the whole room was rank with fear. The lights were kept to a minimum. Even the creaking of the floorboards would have been enough to set them on edge. Every person passing by in the street, any muffled voice on the other side of the door would have been met with a shh. Don't let them know we're in here. Would they, would they, who would have been startled at the rustling of a leaf, dared to answer if anyone knocked? And it would have been even worse, I tell you today, if the voice on the other side of the door said, it's me, Jesus. That would have only made things worse, wouldn't it? That would have only heightened their fear. If they would have dared anything, they would have dared to say something like, go away, Judas, we're not falling for that one. Or maybe, just maybe, one of them would have worked up his nerve and said, this is no time for a practical joke, Thomas, and this one is definitely not funny. Which of them, which of those 12, or, was it, or maybe it was only 10, which of those 10 men would dare to answer the door and look into the eyes of him whose eyes are like a flame of fire? Would any of you? Adam and Eve tried to hide behind fig leaves long ago in the garden. And now we find these ten disciples hiding behind a locked door. And to this day, we know just what they're thinking. We are well acquainted with fear. We are well acquainted with how it locks us up, with how it enslaves. That's how fear works, isn't it? It takes over. Fear is like a prison house. It is like slavery. That's the way the Bible speaks of it. Perhaps it's something as simple as physical fears, right? The disciples had those. What painful things awaited them at the hands of the Jews? And you know those fears too. The pains, the weaknesses of the body, the sicknesses that come over all of us, and the humiliation that sets in with all of that. We know that kind of fear. But we also know that there are deeper fears, aren't there? There are deeper fears than what may simply happen to our bodies. There are also those fears about the corporate bodies in which we live and move. We fear what happens to the three spheres of the church, the family, the government, and there seems to be no end to all the terrible things we might imagine. The disciples feared that kind of fear too. They feared what would happen to their little burgeoning community of faith. Better put, they feared what had already happened. They feared the shattering. 
They feared the scattering. They feared that the end had come. These bones weren't going to rise up and live, were they? Already, one of their own wanted to separate from them, and now it was only a matter of time, wasn't it, before the rest went the way of Thomas. And surely they're right to fear that, aren't they? After all, in their minds, their leader, their Jesus, is dead. And even though the women had brought back this strange rumor of an empty tomb and an encounter with the risen Lord, they had not seen him. You know those fears that come upon us, don't you? You know how we fear what will happen to our physical body and what will happen to the little spheres that we live in. What if our congregation doesn't grow in the next 30 years? What if we're in for a period of declining numbers? What if being a disciple of Jesus is no longer not just respectable, but what if worse, it's disreputable? What if it's a sign of weakness? And what about all those who've separated themselves from us? What would that mean for our family? for our city, for our commonwealth, for our nation. Surely, surely it's not good things. These are the things that were swirling in the minds of those disciples, and it's the same thing that swirls around us now. Wherever there is fear, there is a fear of judgment, isn't there? Ultimately, fear has to do with coming to some sort of judgment. We don't want to face death, not just because of the physical process of dying, but because we are afraid of what comes next. It's like Adam and Eve. It's like these disciples. They they hide because they are afraid. What would Jesus say if I opened the door to him? What would he say about me? How am I possibly going to stand and give an account for the past week or the past month or the past year, let alone every moment of my life? It seems better in light of all of that, doesn't it, to keep the doors locked? It seems better to keep quiet. It seems better not to stir. It seems better not to answer the knocking on the door. In our own time, we hear all about fear and anxiety and worry, don't we? But we hear people talking about the mental health crisis. And what is that other than the slavery and the prison of fear? Think about the treatments that are offered. Think about the treatments that are proposed to deal with a mental health problem. Any treatment of fear and its offspring, anxiety and worry and anger, that only touches your mind is only too shallow of a treatment. Now, there may be value to learning about the hormones and how these things need to be balanced and how this pill may help with that particular thing. But you are more than just a mind, aren't you? And it won't simply do just to talk about it all. See, that's the other trap we fall into. We suppose that what the medications won't chase away, we can chase away by talking about it, right? If we can just learn to put a label on our fears, if I can identify what I might think is the origin then, then maybe I can deal with it. Well, maybe. Then again, maybe not. There is some truth to all of these things, certainly, but quite often, quite often, talking about fear and anxiety and worry only amplifies fear and anxiety and worry. It's like quicksand, isn't it? The more you talk about it, the more you flail around in it, the worse it gets. See, here's a good way to think about how fear works on us. It locks us in on ourselves. And you, locked in on yourself, are the very monster or the very weakness that brings out fear. Perfect love, Scripture says. Perfect love is needed to cast out fear. That's the true psychological remedy that the Bible describes. And when I say that word psychological, I mean it in all of its biblical richness. Your psyche is not just your mind, but your psyche is your soul. The care and the cure of your soul is about more than just the adjustment of hormonal levels. For you, you are more than a cocktail to be mixed. You are an embodied soul, and Jesus means to set you free. And what that means is that he must deliver his perfect love. For perfect love is what pulls you out of the quicksand. Perfect love is what will free you from slavery. Perfect love is what flings open the doors of the prison. Here's how it goes in John 20. Jesus came, and he didn't knock. He came, and he stood among them. 
Peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his side. Peace be with you again. Then they rejoiced. And he said to them, so I send you. And saying this, he breathed on them. Receive my Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven. And whosoever not, they are not. Do you see how all these things are the perfect package deal of perfect love? The arrival of Jesus, the proclamation of his peace, the display of his wounds, and then their joy and his sending, the Holy Spirit's giving their mission. Just so, just so, I tell you today, Jesus broke into that room and he robbed them. And what a wonderful theft it is. For where Jesus comes in, their fear is driven out. Jesus comes and he takes their fear, he takes their anxiety, he takes their worry, and he gives them, in place of all that, peace and joy. That's a package deal, isn't it? But that jailbreak goes like lightning. It's uh, just a couple of verses in the text, so we need to slow it down just a bit this morning. First, think of that Easter package as his arrival. First in the package is his arrival. He doesn't wait. He doesn't knock and let them kind of come to their senses. He takes the initiative. Our Lord is always the one who leads, and he invades that fearful room like a thief in the night. And where he comes, he speaks. Your Lord, your God, does not keep silent. He is not content just to be put over in a corner and say, yes, Jesus is with me. He wants to speak. And what he says to them, he says to you as well, peace, he says. And to show that this isn't just some wishful thought, like we might greet one another, I hope you're doing well, I hope you have peace, I hope you have joy this Easter, to show that it's not just a wish, he shows them his hands and his side. Have you ever wondered why the risen body of Jesus still bears those marks? And why do we call them glorious scars? And why would he show them those things? Shouldn't we hide our pains? Shouldn't we hide our scars, our wounds? Why didn't the resurrection of Jesus heal him? Why, didn't it, why did it not leave him with perfect hands? But who says those hands aren't perfect? Isn't that the whole joy of those wounds? His wounds tell a story, as all wounds do, and the story that they tell is the story of what perfect love is willing to do. Those nail marks in his hands are part of the perfection of his resurrection, for the story that they tell is the story of the body of your Lord given for you and the blood of your God shed for your sins. That peace that Jesus announces to them is the peace that comes from the wounds, And that is the answer, that is the treatment that Jesus would apply to each and every one of your fears. That now your life is in those hands. That now the whole world is in the hands that are marked by nails. That now all things are under him who was pierced so that you might be set free. Then the disciples were glad. The Holy Spirit is a master of understatement, is he not? They were glad. Can you imagine the gladness that erupted in that room? Can you imagine the rejoicing? All of the alleluias that we could sing today cannot hold a flame to that wonderful fire that must have burned in them. Jesus gave them joy. And think about what joy does. It is, if you will, the polar opposite of fear. Fear traps you in on yourself. You feel completely isolated, completely alone. But joy, joy is the kind of thing that takes you out of yourself. Joy is the kind of thing that you can get lost in. It takes you out of yourself and into someone or something else. And so their psyches, their souls, were taken out of themselves and into Jesus, into his risen word and into his risen victory. And that meant into his risen mission, too. His sending from the Father now becomes the model for their sending in the Spirit. As the Father was to him, so Jesus says, I will be to you, source and companion and all in all. The little word apostle, maybe you've heard this before, means one who is sent. And so when we speak about the apostolic church, we mean the church that is sent, sent by Jesus, sent with his spirit, accompanied now by Jesus, and sent on a mission 
to do the very same things that he did for them. Christ's church, his apostolic church, is still to this day on a mission to rob the world, to rob it of its fear and give in its place peace and joy. And how? How do we accomplish that? By the forgiveness of sins. See how Jesus links all of these things together, the peace that flows from his wounds, the sending of the disciple, and the forgiveness of sins. At the heart of the apostolic church, at the heart of our mission, was and is and always must be the forgiveness of sins. Now, we can and we should and we must do a lot more. Mercy and fellowship and teaching and counseling all have their place. But here Jesus identifies for us what is at the heart and center of his church, dealing with sin. We call this special authority that Christ gives to his church and to the ministers of the church the office of the keys. It is why the church has always practiced some form of confession and absolution, whether it's just done privately or whether it's done corporately in a general way like we do at the beginning of our service. We have always set apart a time and a place and a way for sins to be named for sins which would lead us into fear and anxiety and worry to be spoken out loud and for the forgiveness of those sins to also be spoken out loud. It won't do for us to say, oh, I remember that. You won't deal with your fears by saying, I remember that once upon a time someone told me that Jesus loved me. Your fear needs to be dealt with out loud. A word must be spoken, a word that you can lose yourself in, a word that you can find joy in. And so just as the Father has sent Jesus, he sends his church now. So that wherever the church announces that forgiveness, wherever it extends its hand, there it is as if the hand of Jesus were reaching out himself. It is as if Jesus is reaching out to you in the words of the absolution and showing you his wounds. These were done for you. Two keys Jesus gave them, of course, the one which opens and the other which binds. To the repentant, forgiveness flows, and with it come peace and joy. But the impenitent will not find an open door in the church. Rather, they will find a warning, a call to come through the open door. Now, Thomas gives us a glimpse of one final fear that Jesus would take from you this morning. It isn't a physical fear that Thomas has, not necessarily. It's not an emotional one, or even, I would argue, the fear of death and judgment. It is the fear of being drawn in. Thomas wants to stand apart. Thomas wants to stay at a distance. Do you know that fear, the fear of being drawn in? Here's how one of my favorite authors puts it. I suppose everyone knows the fear of getting drawn in, that moment at which a man realizes that what seemed mere speculation is at the point of landing him squarely inside, A sense that a door has just slammed behind and left us on the inside. The joy of the resurrection can be a rather scary thing, you know. What if I lose myself in Jesus? What will happen to me? Will I become one of those crazy Christians? Will I become one of those, would I become a pastor? God forbid, I used to say that myself. We say things like this, don't we? I'm not really the church-going type. What would happen to me? I won't really fit in with them. I don't know if I could be one of them, if I could be one of you. I don't sing so good. I don't understand all of those things. And why, why would Jesus want me anyways? And so we keep our distance out of fear, fear of being drawn in. We keep the door open behind us so we can always sneak out if we have to. I'll come in a little, we say, but not too far, not too much. And just so, we miss the whole joy. Fear still has its grip on those who are afraid of being drawn in. It makes no difference to Jesus who you are or where you are or what you suppose yourself to be, what you think you're good for. He wants you in his room, and he wants the door closed behind you, but no longer locked because of fear, closed, I tell you, firmly closed in peace and in joy and in love. And you and all his disciples squarely inside with the risen Lord Jesus where fear cannot get in. Where you can say in life and in conversation, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God. 
To him be the glory, now and always. Amen.